Thank you so much. And it is so wonderful for me to be here with my pediatric colleagues. And um, so many connections. Um, I knew you when, when you were this high. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> 22 years ago. Wow, it's amazing. And my colleagues from IPAS, Jennifer Everhart, Lauren Destino, Becky Blankenberg, my colleagues from uh, education, Fernando Mendoza, we worked together on workforce issues so many years ago. So really a privilege to be here. I'm often in front of non-pediatric audiences now. So I really love the friendly pediatric audience. So thank you for that. Um, my disclosures are that I, I do receive grant funding from several fund, um, federal agencies, and I co-founded and hold equity in the IPAS Patient Safety Institute, which is a continuation of our study work that we are in business to really um, implement effectively large um, systems with um, better communication efforts. And I do receive now travel reimbursement and honoraria. I haven't, I'm just receiving travel now. I'm really excited to be back in person. So we're gonna take a little journey today to talk about the state of pediatrics. And in particular with emphasis on our need right now to really focus on leadership, effective leadership and leadership growth and, and equity for all. We're gonna think about some strategies we can think of to do for ourselves as individuals, our leaders, um, as well as our organizations and our professional societies. So where are we today? I would say we are at a great opportunity point to reset. So we have been in command and control for almost three years. Command and control leadership, our efforts have been just in the moment, you know, what I've been really realizing recently is that my colleagues who are in high level leadership are starting to burn out. So we were appropriately so really worried about our frontline providers for many years. And now I'm really concerned about our leadership because it's been tiring. We have not as leaders had the opportunity to do a lot of proactive thinking, planning, doing the work of why we stepped into leadership. We've been dealing with problems that we had never in imagined, never in a million years imagined. Um, I often say every day I wake up um, as a leader of a large medical school to find that I'm faced with a problem I have never, ever contemplated before, and it needs to be solved quickly. So it's been challenging. And with that, I think we have really cool opportunity. At the beginning of the pandemic, search firms were reaching out to me saying, women are not putting their hat in the ring for leadership positions. They're not doing it. We, right before the pandemic, we had this really nice uptick of people achieving high level leadership and women weren't putting their hat in the ring. And what was interesting is the searches were just moving on. And so we were starting to slip backwards in our progress. And that was very concerning. And then starting in 2021 with a lot of effort from a lot of women and men in leadership of organizations and societies, we were able to make some progress. And I can really proudly say that since January of 2021, 14 of our graduates from ELAM have been appointed as deans, 14. Um, this week, last week, Dr. Andrea Hayes Dixon from the class of 2020 was appointed as the first black woman dean at Howard. Um, and we are making some progress. We have ELAMs who serve in president's positions, uh, in so college presidents. Three of our graduates are NIH Institute leaders. Um, one of our graduates is a finalist for Francis Collins's job at the NIH. So we're really excited about some of our progress there. And another great achievement, your own graduate from the residency program, um, Dr. Judy Schechter is the president and CEO of the American Board of Pediatrics. She's also an ELAM. So we are, are making some progress. And I would profess that pediatrics should be leading the way in demonstrating to the world that we can achieve parity and equity at every level of leadership within our field. And this is a paper I wrote pre-pandemic with Julie Silver and others. And we, we wrote this, because women comprise the majority of pediatricians in the United States, pediatrics has a unique opportunity to stand out as progressively equitable. And despite that, we have some work to do. And I, I think we have to think creatively now. I've been really struck with the fact that the two fields, OBGYN and pediatrics, that have the most women do not work together to address this issue. I don't know why we're not working together. In fact, we share a patient, right, from one spectrum to the other. 
Um, where are we in academic medicine? This is very recent statistics from the AAMC. If you look across all of academic medicine, only 28% of full professors are women, 22% of chairs are women. And with the appointment of Dr. Andrea Hayes Dixon, we finally broke the 20% dean's number. So for the first time ever, we are over 19% of deans being women. That's the first time. And so Barbara Overholzer, who's here, who works with me, we count every single appointment and every single transition out. It's really important to think about. Interestingly, overall, pediatricians are disproportionately deans. It's really interesting. We have a great pathway into the dean's role. I think that's probably because we're great communicators and we understand developmental things. So we have a lot of great skills. Um, if you look in pediatrics, we do better than the national. 39% um, of our full professors are women and 30% of our chairs. But we have still not broken in pediatrics 33%, which to me is critical mass. You can't change real culture and make really big impact in organizations and in our field until we break critical mass. So we're almost there, but we're not there yet. And then our colleagues in OBGYN actually do a little bit better than us, but they also have been, a, they, they have 63% of their workforce are women. And they're similar to us in that they're still in the 30% range for department chairs. ELAM has fellows from dentistry, public health and pharmacy. And you can see that the numbers are a little bit better in some of our fellow um, health sciences uh, fields, but not tremendously better. So when are we going to meet parity for every role of leadership? By the way, our goal at ELAM is to have parity at every level of leadership, the presidents, the provosts, the deans, the chairs. And this was a paper written by Dr. Reshma Jagsi. Um, she's an ELAM from 2020. If you haven't read her work or you're interested in gender equity, you need to read her stuff. She is the premier researcher in the country in this regard. They did a linear forecast looking, starting in 1992, looking forward to see when, if we go at the pace we're going, when would we meet parity for dean's roles and chair's roles? And if you see this graph, by the way, the blue is chairs and the sort of maroon color or whatever color it is, is um, deans. We will not meet parity until 2070, 2070. To put that in perspective, the current medical students in the country will be retired then. I know I will be, I don't know about you guys, but we have to think about this. And keep in mind, this data was pre-pandemic. And in this paper, Dr. Jagsy and her colleagues called out the need for term limits. And they emphasized that they were really excited that the NIH at the time had declared term limits, not for the institute leaders. So there are 27 institutes. Under them, there are branch and lab chief leaders. Other than that, there are no other leadership roles at the NIH. There's not a lot of ways to go up in the NIH. And um, actually, your own Dr. Hannah Valentine and Francis Collins put in a ruling that there would be term limits at that level, the second level. And the week this paper came out, those term limits were overturned. So there are no term limits at the NIH. By the way, I happened to have a site visit there that we that happened. That was a really exciting visit. There was a lot of dissent. Um, how about pediatrics in general and our faculty? These are the numbers for pediatrics. They are similar in academic faculty for surgery, a little bit better in internal medicine in that they have more Asians, but not much better. So across our academic faculty, we don't have a lot of diversity. And if you think about our providers, this is the um, statistics and PEDS across fields. And if we go back to the idea that our, our provider population should reflect our patient population and our faculty who are training, our providers should reflect our patient population. We're very far away from that. And then I'm just going to add a little piece about funding because this is really important to us in academia. Is This is recent data from the NIH. The percentage of funding that goes to women is 36% of the funding. So there's a big disparity there. And if you go back to thinking about infrastructure, intramural infrastructure at the NIH, how that may influence 
extramural structures and processes for reviewing funding, and then who gets funded. And if you're not funded, you can't publish. And if you can't publish, you can't get promoted. So all these systems sort of link together. So we have to think carefully. To the NIH's credit, um, I was invited to a two-day meeting in the spring that brought 100 thought leaders across the country together to start really looking carefully about how can we more effectively support the physician scientist workforce in a diverse way. So they have a lot of great ideas, um, thinking about career trajectories and ways to support flexibility for women scientists, but we have a lot of work to do. Um, by the way, and in this presentation, it often gets really heavy. We feel really depressed with all the data I'm going to show you, but I'm going to turn it in a few minutes, so it gets heavier. Um, how about equal pay? This is a big issue for us everywhere. And I just, before I, I um, started the session this morning, I contacted Amy Starmer, who's a colleague from IPASS, but she's also done a lot of work with the AAP data on our workforce. And as far as we know, there is no more recent data than her last paper, which shares that for pediatricians, women make 90 cents to the dollar that men in pediatrics make in our field. And that's across everything, across academia and non-academics. And then if you compare that to what's happening in the country, many of you are familiar with these dates, but I'd like to read them out because it's just such a, um, an important thing to consider. Equal payday dates. This is not for medicine. This is for everything that we do in the country, all fields, all disciplines. Uh, it is the date that all the women in the country have to work until we make the same amount of money as men made on December 31st, the year prior. So all the women in the country have to work until March 15th, or did work until March 15th of this year, um, for Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander Women's Equal Pay Day. It was May 3rd, and you can see that women are paid 75 cents to the dollar. June 15th, LGBTQ Equal Pay Day. September 8th was Mom's Equal Pay Day. So all of us that have children, that's the day we worked until we were able to make 58 cents to the dollar. Um, September 21st, Black Women's Equal Pay Day. November 30th, we haven't gotten there yet, Native Women's Equal Pay Day. And this one really is just the most painful for me. December 8th, Latino Women's Equal Pay Day. We have to do better. And it's really interesting in medicine for the last 20 years or more, we've thought a lot about gender equity in medicine. And then more recently, we've been really paying a lot of attention to race and ethnicity, but there's so many other aspects of diversity that we need to include. And so this is the wheel, um, the diversity wheel from Johns Hopkins. I really like it. The inner circle are dimensions of diversity that tend to be. Um, more permanent and visible. Um, the outer circle are factors of diversity that tend to be changing over time or not visible. And what's really interesting, so for me and my dean's role, I'm supposed to be tracking diversity for lots of reasons. Um, and there's a lot of difficulty in getting the data. What should we be asking? How confidential is it? How willing will people be to? contributing to the data. And yet, if we don't think about all these elements of diversity, we're not optimizing our workforce so that we can provide the best patient care and do the best science. So we have to go beyond what we've been doing. And there's a lot of national attention to that. And I know many of you are, are active in groups thinking about this. COVID-19. Um, we were talking, um, Francisco and I were talking about how different COVID has made our lives. And we all know that. We are all experiencing that. And it's been a real concern for us thinking about opportunities for women and men of color and women with intersectionality uh, because we're taking the brunt of a lot of issues in COVID-19. And if you go back to that story I told you about women not putting their hat in the ring, there's a lot of concern. And there is a phenomenon of this is what really worries me also, is women at mid-career are leaving the field. They are leaving our field at alarming rates. And we're just starting to look at the AAMC data on that. And it's amplified for women of color. 
And so we have a, a big workforce concern. Um, Eve Higginbotham, um, she's from the ELAM class of 2001. She is the Dean of Diversity at Penn. And she was quoted as saying this, if institutions do not aggressively correct for what I just described, then we will see fewer women being promoted to, to professor, to leadership positions. It's just going to look like the 1950s again. So this is a reality that we have to consider. I mentioned the uh, mid-career uh, workforce issue that I'm quite concerned about. This is a paper that Julie Silver and I and others wrote um, right at the it was published right at the beginning of the pandemic. And it's about the invisibility of the mid-career women in academic medicine. And the phenomenon goes like this. If you are a superstar undergraduate student, you are highly sought after as a woman into medical school, and you do really well in medical school, and you're highly sought after to go into residency, and then from there into fellowship, and there, then we want you as our faculty. And then about mid-career, you start competing with everybody else. And the support changes. The emphasis on you changes. And there's all of a sudden this great vulnerability. And this is amplified for women of color and other intersectionality. And it's a real phenomenon. And what I've been proposing to the institutions I've been talking with in the last two years is to really focus on mid-career faculty. We do a lot of thinking about recruitment and onboarding. We don't do enough for the mid-career sustainment, engagement, support to make sure everybody thrive, thrives. And then again, going back later at the end of the life, life cycle of the faculty member, we have to think about um, support for faculty to transition gracefully. By the way, we call this the Jennifer syndrome. I think you know this. <laughs> the reason for that is there are many women at mid-career named Jennifer. And uh, a quick story on that. I was asked to speak at Comcept. It was the Miller Sarkin keynote. You know, very honored to do that. And I arrived. It was one of my first in-person. I think it was my first in-person presentation. And everybody was sort of discombobulated. Nobody could remember anymore how to get badges and do all that stuff you do when you get to a conference. And so I was waiting patiently in line. Um, for my turn. And the woman ahead of me said, I need a new badge. I lost my badge. And the, the person, the Degnon person said, well, what's your name? And she said, my name's Jennifer. And she said, there are a lot of Jennifers here. <laughs> <laughs> Diversity is incredibly important. We know that they're there. By the way, I, if you're interested in this field, I would really propose to you, we don't need any more studies that show that there are disparities we need to show evidence of impact and positive things. We, I have stacks, and st I still have old paper stacks of papers over the last 25 years showing that there are disparities in every field, in every part of every field. And we need to move on to like what is really effective and helpful. So we know that emergency medicine programs that have a higher percentage of women residents are more likely to have women chief residents. So that's really cool. OBGYN residencies have greater diversity when they have diverse faculty. And that's another study that shows the positive impact. I often show this to um, uh, lay audiences. Uh, patients treated by women physicians have a lower odds of death. That's pretty powerful. And there's a concordance of treatment. Women who have heart attacks have better survival rates if they're treated by women physicians. So there's a lot of interesting data that we need to think about. Healthcare studies show patients generally fare better when cared for diverse teams. Professional skills focus studies generally find improvements to innovation, team communications. And I love this, improved risk assessment. Financial performance also improved with increased diversity. There was a Catalyst article right around the beginning of the pandemic that looked at um, men and women physicians spending time at our favorite activity, the EHR. And it, it was fascinating. It demonstrated that women physicians spend more time documenting in the EHR, are faster to respond to abnormal lab results, and are quicker to return calls to patients. Very interesting. So diversity is important. Students trained at diverse schools are more comfortable treating patients from a wide range of ethnic backgrounds. Um, 
I don't know if you know this, but US News and World Report put, puts out a, a diversity ranking of all of our medical schools. So I looked you up this morning. You're doing pretty well in terms of student diversity. So you're 26 out of 154. So that's really great. And that really gives opportunity for all of you in the whole pathway to advancement. And how can we build a pathway to equity? We have to get away from fixing the individual. The ELAM is coined the term, get away from fixing the woman to fixing the system. And that is really where we need to be, but we all need to be involved at every level. We have to think about policies. I, I often joke that um, my job right now is I'm in charge of the policies of my medical school. If you had told me 10 years ago that my job was all about policies, I would have said, I do not want that job. But it's so incredibly important. And to think about policies that support it, every part of the life cycle, and that they don't live in filing cabinets, either electronic or real, that they are really implemented very well. Um, how we think about departmental and division governance is really important. Um, and this is true in our field as well, is that you look at the diversity of leadership in an organization, and most likely, the positions of power of resource allocation are held by men and the education positions are held by women. And so not that they're not important and training is really important, but you have to think carefully about who's in charge, who's making the decisions and where are those resources going. How we think about our professional society governance is important. Our, it, luckily, pediatrics is leading the way here. We have done a lot in the last many years to support women in leadership of uh, our professional organizations, who's receiving awards, who is on committees, et cetera. And then we have to think about metrics at every level that are meaningful that we can track. Uh, we were talking a little bit about this last night at dinner, um, the taxes and subsidies that exist out there. And luckily, the academic world is paying attention. And so the group on faculty affairs at the AAMC that is really in charge of thinking about appoint appointments and promotions processes has really been thoughtful about considering how can we change our policies for promotion and tenure to really support everybody to be able to contribute in non-RVU or research dollar ways to our organizations so that we can all be supported in our advancement. So the citizenship tax is what you all know is in order to sustain all the missions of our organizations and our medical schools, we have to sit on committees, we have to do searches. There are a lot of time intensive things that don't count towards promotion. They take us away from our time to see patients generate RVUs or to do research in our labs and publish. So that's a concern. Um, it's compounded for, for women with intersectionality or underrepresented men because they are overtaxed and over asked because we need diversity at all of our committees and all of our, we need uh, a diverse set of voices. So. There's an extra tax if you have uh, another underrepresented uh, status. And on the flip side, there's something called the majority subsidy, which is those of us who don't have an underrepresented um, piece of us are not asked. And so we do have more time to generate our views and do our work, our, our lab work or whatnot. So the drivers of change need to be at every level, as I mentioned, individuals and allies. And we have to move to a culture of allyship and it has to be effective and meaningful. And that's the conversation we have, Mary, is that we um, spend a lot of time, women spend a lot of time fighting for these issues underrepresented in medicine do. It needs to be the white men making the charge. They need to be the most active in this fight um, in culture change. And from an institutional organizational structure, things will not change until the right people are making the decisions at the table. Uh, this is a um, an approach to think about gender diversity and inclusion, um, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Uh, again, Julie Silver and I and others uh, published this in that pediatrics paper. And if you look at it closely, for those of us in hospital medicine and patient safety, it's very much like a PDSA cycle. It's really taking a close look at the data and making it transparent. By the way, I've been on a 
national group trying to encourage all of our national organizations to be public with their data and have it be the same metrics and the same data. So we can look at leadership and awards and things across all of our disciplines, surgery, medicine, pediatrics, OBGYN. So we need to look carefully at our data. We need to be completely transparent. We need to really investigate causality in a meaningful way, not a superficial way. Do effective implementation. And again, this is where this is where the, the world is ripe for study and publication and sharing is those implementing implementation of effective things and showing outcomes and how we are going to share those with the world. For individuals, I run a leadership program. Uh, I believe in leadership training. I believe in strategic career planning and I believe in allyship and I believe in the skill of graceful self-promotion. And there's a great paper I can share with you about how to do this well. Um, it's the opposite of what I share is, um, you know how we're at PAS and a fellow or a young faculty member present their data and then somebody gets up to the mic and says their name and then all of a sudden everybody in the room notice that they're the most famous person around that particular topic area in the world. And then instead of asking a really nice question, they just tell them how famous they are <laughs> and all the things that they did. You don't want to do that. Leadership training is incredibly important. And I would add for women, it's critically important. And you need to have leadership training at every stage of your career because you apply the skills you learn differently. And with leadership training comes come networks that are so powerful. If you ask anybody who's been to Elam, they will say the most powerful part of Elam is being part of this network of 1,300 people across the country who, are, who also hold leadership positions. When um, this most recent dean, Dr. Hayes Dixon, was appointed, the first thing she did is reach out to me and say, I need to talk to the other women deans who were just appointed in the last year. So it's that lifting everybody up together. So leadership training, very, very important. For leaders, um, we have to think very strategically as leaders about who are we supporting? Who are we sponsoring? Who are we mentoring? Um, who, uh, do we have diversity in that, in that field? Uh, we have to think about diversity at the leadership table. And I, I'm really struck with how often I go into an institution where there's a lot of diversity in the faculty, a lot of diversity at about the mid-level, and then there's not diversity at the top. And what's happening is the people at the top are making decisions. They're a non-diverse group making decisions for a very diverse group. And so that's really a problem. And I'll, I'll share a little anecdote. This is a real story. Um, I went to a, a very well-known big institution. I won't tell you where, and I won't tell you what it is. Um, and I was invited for a two-day visiting professorship. The first day I spent on the medical school side and the second day on the hospital side. And uh, the first day, the first thing I always do is meet with faculty because then you hear the real story about what's happening. And then I met with the dean, who's a white man, who was a big ELAMP supporter. And um, he told me what he thought was happening. And then I told him what I thought was happening. We had a really nice conversation. And after that visit, he opened up opportunities for his women faculty. The second day I went over to the um, hospital side and it was classic. I, I went up in an elevator to the top floor and at the top there were um, offices all around the perimeter with gorgeous views. And every one of those offices was populated by a white man, except for which role? The diversity officer. No, they didn't even have a diversity officer. Um, the CNO. Um, so I went and and it was it was fascinating. In the middle were uh, pods of women typing, all the assistants. So by the way, the faculty is quite diverse at this place. So I went in to meet with a CEO and I have a witness. I brought my assistant dean, so I have a witness for this, and he was telling me. <clears throat> He said, uh, you know, we do great things with diversity here. We are so inclusive. And then he said, we are a great leadership team here. We are efficient, effective, robust, strong. All those agentic words, agentic words are termed, you know, are associated with strong male leadership. And then he said, we are such a good team that every Saturday we play golf together. 
He actually said that out loud. I was stunned. And, and what was fascinating is where were the most important decisions being made for that organization? They were being made on Saturday mornings. And who was not there? So it, it's something to really consider. The other thing I would add for us as individuals when you're thinking about leaders, right now in the pandemic in particular, I keep saying to my faculty and to others, I, my mentees, I'm, I keep saying, when you're with your leader, don't ask them for money or, or a resource. Ask them what you can do to help. What can you do to help right now? I'm saying this on Mary's behalf. You want, it's what I, we laugh, my boss is the dean. Um, we have a joke in our school that um, people, our faculty think he has an ATM machine in his office. And if only we would give them the pin number, everything would be solved. So remember, to think about how can you align with the efforts moving forward and how can you help. The other things about leadership we have to think about is I mentioned that we don't have a lot of diversity at the top level groups who are making decisions. And often we don't have diversity enough at all to make a difference. So I, I was at another very large medical school where they had 27 clinical chairs and only three of them were women. And what was happening is their voices were not being heard at all. And there's a great vulnerability too for if there are a few women at the top, women are much more visible with any misstep or, are, or, or have attributions of, of bad things. So we have to think very carefully about what the representation is at the top. We need to have that critical mass to make a difference. So over 33% to really make culture change and make a difference. Also, um, we have to think about, I told you about the vulnerability of the mid-career faculty. We have to think about ways to support them to come back or to take a break. We have to be much more creative and open because I'm really wor worried that if we don't carefully consider returnship, we're going to be in that 1950s place pretty soon again. So it's um, important to consider. And then thinking about those policies that support all um, and flexibility. By the way, what I heard at the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of schools, and I don't know what your school did, they were pausing tenure track um, uh, timelines, promotions, and that's not what women wanted at all. They wanted support and flexibility to continue to do their work. They wanted more childcare. They wanted scribes. They wanted all kinds of things that would make them more effective and efficient so that they could do their science and to do their work. I adapted this from uh, the AAMC's uh, faculty life cycle model um, to add this exit entry point piece. I think we have to be very thoughtful about how to support. And as I mentioned before, we paid so much attention over the last several years to recruitment, 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 recruitment. And we're not thinking about engagement, retention, help along the way. And another piece I think we need to think about is the retirement part. Is, uh, we don't have term limits in medicine. Mayo Clinic does. Other than that, we don't have term limits. Um, and uh, that, that's a problem. We don't also have succession planning, really solid succession planning. Uh, and I think that's a really important piece as well. How can we support people to gracefully move to the next stage of their career, allowing others to come up the pathway and supporting them is really important. Um, again, I mentioned um, metrics. We have to think what's meaningful, create dashboards, be really public with them, and being open to feedback and to suggestions about how to be innovation, uh, to do innovation right now. For public organizations and professional organizations, I'm sorry, we have to think again about metrics um, for our organizations. By the way, for leaders, a new trend that is coming is to tie DEI metrics to uh, compensation for high-level leaders, chairs, deans, that type of thing. So maybe that will help us push the needle as well. Um, we have to think about all the organizations that are investing in women. Invest for Her is Julie Silver's new campaign that I'm a co-sponsor of. Um, you can follow her on Twitter. You can follow me, but I'm not as active. <laughs> um, my favorite Twitter, Twitter story is um, I had to sign up for Twitter for iPass. Glenn Rosenbluth created my account 
And then I had like five followers. I think it was Bernard Dreyer, Lewis first. Like that was my group. And then my niece. And then my niece, she was like 16 at the time. She sent out something about the Kardashians and I was trying to delete it, but I retweeted it. So my first tweet to Lewis first and Bernard Dreyer was about the Kardashian family. Anyway, there are a lot of incredibly wonderful, active people in these organizations doing great stuff and we need to support them. What's interesting also is for many of these organizations, the majority of people are involved are women and not men. And we have to think creatively about how can we engage our male colleagues. Policies I mentioned so critically important um, and being transparent about them. I've just done some very recent work with Dr. Reshma Jagzi, Dr. Maya Iyer, and some others around um, our work environments and harassment. And we've been doing a series of webinars across the country. And uh, the hardest piece of this work is that people don't want to report and people are afraid and people are afraid of retaliation. And that's across the board in our organizations. So how we consider uh, developing our policies, implementing them, but then having safe, truly safe, psychologically safe work environments and reporting structures so that we can make a difference is a, a really important consideration. We have to get out of our silo. This is a plea again for all of you as pediatric leaders to let's talk to our OBGYN colleagues. They're doing similar things. Why are we not working across disciplines? ELAM does some of this, but we need to do a better job within you know, our own disciplines in networking. Um, we just launched uh, a new organization called GEMS, Gender Equity in Academic Medicine and Science. You're gonna say, why do we need another organization? <laughs> Good question. It's an organization of organizations and everybody's welcome to join. Becky, by the way, I put a plea out to the APPD, APS, SPR, APA, all the A's that we belong to. Um, we are, this, these are the organizations involved. And um, what happened was in the pandemic, we came together as leaders of these organizations to say, how can we work together to leverage our power and make significant change? Help the leaders at AAMC make significant change in the Council of Deans or across the department chair groups. So our organization is open to joining, by the way. Um, and at, at this point, there's not a fee, but we're trying to leverage our collective voice and power to make a difference. I mentioned allyship has never been more important. We did not talk about allyship five years ago. We really didn't. We were very much about mentorship. Then we were about sponsorship. Now we're about allyship because we can't make change unless everybody's doing this work together. And the white man voice, men's voice, put that backwards. It's really critically important. Um, Dr. Monica Lipson, who is the Vice Dean of Education at Columbia, she is an Elam, and I've been working with her a lot recently on thinking about allyship. These are the definitions she uses. I mean, to get inclusion, to really foster inclusion, we have to think about the ABCs. A is acceptance, B belonging, C community. We need to affirm belonging, address harm, advocate for change, stand up, speak out. Allies need to lean into the discomfort. And to be a true ally, there is risk involved. It, it is. And I believe now, maybe you've done this, um, we all need to have upstander training. We have to. I have been in situation after situation in the last two years where really sophisticated high level leaders freeze when there's a micro or macro aggression happening. It's really remarkable. We all have to be trained to be able to um, intervene in the moment. And for those of us in the majority, we have to think about how we can ally for our, our colleagues. And this goes beyond men being allies for women. White women need to be strong allies for women of color or intersectionality because they've had a very different experience than me as a white woman. Interestingly, across business, and by the way, if you're interested in leadership, subscribing to the Harvard Business Review is the best thing to do because um, they're, we're constantly pulling ideas from them uh, into our world. But senior level women are much more likely to be an ally than senior level men. Relatively few black women and Latinas say their strongest allies are white and very few women 
and men from the LGBT community say that they have allies or have experienced allyship. So we have a lot of important work to do. Um, I have been partnering with David Smith and Brad Johnson, who wrote the book, uh, Good Guys and Athena Rising. And I have an opportunity where in the spring at ELAM, at their graduation, all the deans come to support the fellows. And um, most of them are men. And uh, I'm bringing David and Brad to talk to them. At that. I'm trying to trick them into learning how to be allies. Don't tell them that. But Dr. Lipson says, we have to take allyship to the next le level. And she was uh, quoting uh, MJ Middle. If I'm already an ally, why do I need to transition to be a co-conspirator? To put it simply, being an ally is lazy. A conspiracy is created when two people intentionally form an agreement and intend to achieve it through some act or preparation. A co-conspirator is one who chooses to take part in the conspiracy and deliberately acknowledges that there's a structural problem. So we need to elevate these concepts in our organizations across healthcare in general. We also have to think about how we all stay informed. So the burden of this learning is on each of us not on others to educate us, but it's on us. So we need to be active readers. We need to listen to other thought leaders. We need to keep abreast of terminology. I, I have to say, and for those of you who work in this space, it's a full-time job. I mean, all the time I'm learning about terminology we should not be using anymore. Um, and so we have to be very careful about terminology. Um, and then we have to think about if we're going to really effectively change our organizations, we have to think the, about the politics of our organizations. And I often joke, if you've seen one medical school, you've seen one medical school. If you've seen one department of pediatrics, you've seen one. The politics are different everywhere. This is a great article in Harvard Business Review that helps you think through the po politics of your own organization, looking at the source of power and where decisions are made. Is it top down? Is it bottom up? It's very interesting. Read this. It will really, you'll reflect on your own place and say, oh, that's why that happens there. And that's why I wasn't effective or that's why I was effective. And we need to think about um, what the drivers are and we need to not be afraid of change. I think we're so funny in medicine. We always say we want to change and then we never want to change ever. Um, and we have to be more open um, to that and not resistant. And again, think, how can I help? Rather, how then how should I like put dig my feet in and resist this change? So I'm going to end with something really uh, positive, which so outside the box, outside the silos, a couple of years ago, several of us in academic medicine partnered with the women's national soccer team to think about pay equity. And you'd say, why are, are these academic people partnering with the soccer team? And as you know, um, at the time, the women, this was about three years ago, four years ago, the women's national soccer team had just won their second World Cup. And they were making significantly less than the men. And they, the men hadn't won anything. So um, we were partnering with them to think strategically about pay issues. And they went on. They just um, received a settlement of $24 million in back pay. So that was really a, a great victory for all of us. And finally, I'm going to leave you with I don't know if any of you know Dr. Omolara Umadino. She is a pediatrician in New York. How many people know her? This is her daughter, and she's going to summarize what I just said in a minute. Everyone who is worried and scared, do not fear, because we women are strong. Whatever color we are, whatever shape we are, whoever we are, we are strong women and girls. We will save the world just like the first ones did. And we are very, 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 very worried, but we can make through this and we'll make through it together. Yeah, all right, bye guys. I hope that lifted you up. This for me. <laughs> Thank you, Dara. Thank you. <laughs> And you have some opportunity for questions. Thank you for that uh, wonderful tour of all the inequities that are present in some solutions. So a lot of the things that you spoke about are really explicit. 
Um, I'm wondering if there's much consideration given to more of the implicit sort of structural biases that exist that we keep weaving into the system that really receive little to no attention, things that actually really fall disproportionately uh, on the shoulders of women. So, so some of the biggest sort of uh, experiments that we've undertaken without any data at all in medicine in the last 20 years, my two favorites are the EMR, which mm -hmm. I think we can all agree is um, disproportionately hurts people who are more conscientious. And we can argue about who's more conscientious or not, but I think we all know the answer to that. And um, and the second thing is is really uh, how education's unfolded uh, with a lot of that uh, citizenship tax and really the work hour limitations as well, which I think also sort of disproportionately tax or hurt women. And there are other examples too, but I'm wondering if, if you and your organization is giving that implicit inequity uh, gender-wise any consideration. Yes, um, thank you for that question. And I would say, yes, we, we're, a lot of us are thinking about this all the time. Um, and there are um, efforts to address uh, uh, a lot of these issues. Um, there are, the NIH, when they convened, um, the two-day uh, think tank about the physician scientist workforce and thinking about these issues, a lot of what you just described were the focus, the focal point of the conversations. Um, and we have to be creative and we have to invest. And I would say the, the places that are moving along the fastest are actively investing significant money in addressing these issues. I spoke to one CEO um, who um, has been really creative in his efforts to support women physicians and physician scientists through flexibility in childcare, sick care, um, thinking creatively about how people are promoted to leadership roles, a lot of innovation. And I asked him, um, how was he funding that? And he said, well, in the middle of the pandemic, he's, when everybody's challenging, he said, challenged. He said, I'm putting a lot of money into this. And I said, how can you afford it? And he said, how can I not afford it? I can't afford not to do it, right? So yes, there is a lot of consideration. By the way, the other, the other con concern I have right now in the country is we have a lot of um, groups looking at gender equity, and then we have a lot of other groups looking at DEI in general. And sometimes we're competing for resources and we're not all working together. So um, in my organization, I have a weekly meeting of the, the deans from DEI, the deans from um, faculty affairs, the deans of faculty development, the deans of women, all together. We work together on every problem um, and uh, we have to think creatively. But we have to put money into it. Any other questions? Nancy, thank you for that wonderful presentation, inspiring, and for your inspiring leadership. You. <clears throat> you know, when all this started in the 70s with regard to diversity, it was white men, because that's the only group that was around that really right. stood up and said something. Unfortunately, the motivation for that was the death of Martha Luther King and the guilt that that you know, group felt. What kinds of things can we do to, one, get more white men motivated? And hopefully the other one is put them in the right positions to do something. Yes. Oh, that's a great question. And that's that's been a focus of that GEMS group I talked about, is how, if I look at this audience here, and I know we're a pediatric audience, but most of the people here are women. And we're often speaking to women. Um, and uh, we need to be speaking to men. Brad and, and David will share that when they're going to speak to groups of all men who have been, so that they'll get hired for a, a consultation to speak to the men to do allyship training or whatnot, they'll say the men will sit there with their arms crossed, you know, really resistant. Um, I find it's fascinating. You know, when there is a light bulb that goes off for men, particularly white men, is when they have a daughter in the workforce. Their daughters are in their 20s. And all of a sudden, it's like they never knew this was happening in the world. And now they can see it happening for their own children. So um, we have to do a better job getting in front of the audience with power. To me, in, in medical schools, it's the Council of Deans. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Spector. This was um, amazing. Um, and thank you for touching on the reentry, which I think is such a huge problem right now. I was wondering, I, I know Drexel University is one of the only places that has an official kind of onboarding reentry program. And I was wondering if you could share some of the best practices or policies that have that you found effective to help bring specifically women back into the workforce. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, Yes, we have a we have the longest standing program. And it was really funny. When it first started, I was put in charge of it and I didn't really believe in it. I, I was a resistor. And now I'm just totally embracing it. I think the problems we have are very practical problems, is that we have to convince our state boards, our medical boards, and our certification boards that we can do this in a different way. There, there are a lot of barriers to coming back, if you've been out for more than five to 10 years, getting your medical license back or getting certified again in your board specialty is really a struggle. So we have to be more creative there. Um, the training is almost the, the least of the worries I have. Although um, it is sometimes hard to convince clinicians to allow somebody to come and have them retrained with them and their math practice issues and such. But I'm more worried about the actual legal pieces, the boards and the certifications that will then allow people to practice. So I think that's the work we have to do. A couple of <clears throat> questions from chat. Uh, would love to see a study comparing the trends in diversity and equity before and after the appointment of women as department chair or med school dean. That's a good question. Comments. So in general, well, let's check out Mary's data. <laughs> um, no, it, that's those are really good questions, and there is definitely evidence of improvement um, along the way. Uh, I didn't touch on this though. Uh, when women get into high-level leadership positions, there is a vulnerability for them, and there are two phenomena. Uh, that happen sometimes to women in high level leadership is they take a big job, a really big job. And then when they get in the job, the power is taken away from them. So they thought they were the chair and over the practice plan and had all these different roles. And then they get there and the practice plan role gets taken away. And so there's a lot of trickiness that happens. Um, and I have a lot of anecdotal uh, data to share about that. And that puts then the, the woman leader at a disadvantage from truly making the change they want to change. Uh, change, And then they tend to, by the way, women tend to be in interim positions and not get the permanent positions. And we're put in interim positions to fix problems that were caused by our previous leaders who were not women. It happens all the time. And then when they fix the problems and stabilize, then they don't get the permanent job. So I didn't really answer your question because it's so complicated, but. Yeah, one more question. Time. Um, why is it so difficult to engage men in allyship for gender equity when there is a decent chance that many of them are fathers to daughters? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you don't. We all have our own lived experience and people just don't see it. And I've had I've had so many. Um, arguments, my watch is telling me I have to walk more steps. Um, so many um, arguments with men, helping them to understand that there really is a problem because they're not seeing the problem and they don't have that problem and they don't, they didn't live that difficulty. So it takes some convincing, but then maybe every man should have a daughter. I don't know. <laughs> So um, if I had one question for you, yeah. and then we'll just close. So um, you talked about the importance of intervention. So I'm sure you know about the University of Pennsylvania randomized control trial that Jay Agerso and Stephanie Avowed led, um, which was a clustered randomized trial where they went in and did an intervention to promote, try to promote uh, academic success of women. As part of that, they created a metric called creating the culture inducive to the academic success of women, which we've actually shown those data and talked about that in, in this department in prior years. But fundamentally, the intervention didn't work. And do you have any uh, thoughts about lessons learned? Yes. Um, I feel like our environments are so complicated that it's really hard to just, it goes back to implementation. You know, it's kind of the work I do in the IPAS study group. It's all about the implementation. You can create the best idea, but if you don't implement it effectively, 
then you can't change. Thank you. So um, in prior years, we've shown the compensation data here. We've shown that it's airtight as regards to gender. We've looked at whether or not you have an office or a cubicle. We've looked at lab space. We looked at startup packages. What we're just starting to look at is time to promotion. Um, and I can it's very, very difficult. Cox proportional hazard models. <laughs> My poor statistician knows more about our faculty lines than any other statistician, I'm sure. Right now, we're not seeing any signal for differences in gender, although we might be within different divisions. So as I'm listening to you and I'm taking notes, and I really want everyone who's here to think about what else do we need to measure? Um, what, how can we be more transparent? Um, lots of ideas about next steps. So I just want to thank you for really uh, holding our feet to the fire. And I know from texts I'm getting from many of you that we're really inspired about next steps. And you and I have a meeting this afternoon yeah. to talk about a number of things. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.